Well, thank you very much. This is my first appearance here. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss American smokeless tobacco products. Jerry, uh, when he wrote me, he said, give us some background and give us an update on these products. And that's what I intend to do. So the, the update starts on March 26, 1981. This was the publication date of a study of smokeless tobacco and mouth cancer conducted by Deborah Wynn, who was, pre was presenting her doctoral work at the University of North Carolina at the time. She ended up at the uh, National Cancer Institute as an epidemiologist. She basically published a finding that started the American crusade against smokeless tobacco. Before that, it was basically a, a, a common habit, okay? But now it was a death sentence for mouth cancer. She said that smokeless tobacco use had high risk. Her, pub, her findings were publicized across the country. They basically set the pace for inaccurate warnings on smokeless tobacco products, legislation, uh, uh, NIH reports, a whole host of activities that led to what we think we know now about smokeless tobacco. Now it turns out though that all she was doing was studying a powder dry snuff product that's a very obscure, uh, very uncommon product in the United States. So what I need to do is give you a quick introduction about products. Now, first of all, we're going to dismiss the American and Swedish snus products because they are of recent introduction in the US. They've been around about 10 years or 15 years, uh, and they're really not commonly used. This powder dry snuff product Think of it as baby powder. It was that, uh, that, was that kind of uh, substance. Uh, in Europe, this powder is inhaled through the nose. But in the US, going back as far as the Civil War in the 1860s, this product was used by women in the South as their form of smokeless tobacco. It, it hardly exists. It's a very, very uh, low prevalence use of tobacco. Men in the United States favor moist snuff, which is kind of equivalent to Swedish snus, and chewing tobacco, which is shredded tobacco cased with sugar that you see in the baseball-sized wad in the cheek. That's the way that American men have always used smokeless tobacco. Now, when you look at the risk factors for mouth cancer, and when we talk about relative risks, we're talking about a multiplier, okay? All of us, no matter what we do, we have a small risk for mouth cancer, very, very small. So if you have a multiplier of 10 for smoking, a career of smoking gives you a tenfold higher risk, that's a pretty substantial risk. Alcohol abuse itself, without any tobacco, also gives you risk for mouth cancer in the range of four, as does now, we know this from recent research, human papillomaviruses. The same viruses that cause cervical cancer, they can be sexually transmitted to the mouth. Now, American smokeless tobacco products were all perceived to be the same. And in 2002, we did a comprehensive review of all of the studies, and we, found, and we sorted the products out according to type, and we found that powder dry snuff, yes, it had risks for women in the South, mainly. But chewing tobacco and moist snuff had no risks. Their relative risk was down around one. Multiply a relative risk by one and you get no relative risk. And in fact, uh, we, this has been um, more recently been, uh, I'll show you some other more recent research that has uh, basically agreed with this. Now, when Deborah Wynn uh, published her study, she said if you take 100,000 users of powder dry snuff over a long term, you will see about 26 cases of mouth cancer in, those, in that population every year. Okay, so let's look and see how that translates. 
So cigarettes we know are dangerous. Over a career, we have at least 600 of 100,000 cigarette smokers who will die of various smoking-related diseases. If you don't use tobacco at all, there's going to be three deaths in 100,000 people of, for mouth cancer. With moist, with moist snuff, chew, and snus products, we have the same three. But with powder dry snuff, we're gonna have 12 with a relative risk of four, okay? And while that's been seen as a very high risk, if you compare it to another American and European uh, addiction, automobile use, it just puts it in perspective. So we get to start to sense how, how dangerous this product is. Now let's fast forward now to 2016. And I know you may be looking at me, oh yeah, everybody knows Radu, and you know, he's got this bias. But this study was published by federally funded and federal researchers, that is US government and government funded researchers in 2016. They looked at a large data set, many, many studies in the US, some of them hadn't even been published, and that little circle there, Deborah Wynn was on that, on that uh, panel. And they found that men who used moist snuff or chewing tobacco products had 0.86. Now, it wasn't significantly lower, but it was far lower. While women who use dried powdered snuff had a relative risk of nine. So this has now been confirmed. We know that uh, there's a difference in these products. Now, Peter Lee and John Hamling did a, did a comprehensive study in 2009 of mouth cancer and Swedish and American products, found very little relative risks confirming this study. And he also, they also looked at a whole bunch of other cancers, and the only one they found a significant elevated risk of 1.3, which is relatively modest, was for prostate cancer. Now you know that men who live a long time might develop prostate cancer, so maybe this tells you how long men were living. I don't know. But there are very, very low risks among all cancers for smokeless tobacco users. Now, Lee and Hamling did another really amazing thing that hasn't been advertised very much. And they calculated the number of men dying from cigarette smoking in 2005 in the, in the United States. They said there's about 105,000 men dying of cancer related to smoking. They said if none of those men had ever smoked, but instead had used smokeless tobacco, there would be a thousand deaths. And then they said, geez, that's not very interesting. What if every American man used smokeless tobacco? All of them in the United States at the same pattern of smoking, there'd be 2,000 deaths. So this is really impressive to show you how basically how much difference there is between the risks of smoking and the risks of smokeless tobacco, even American smokeless tobacco products. Now, this year was an extraordinarily, extraordinary publication because up until now, even though our federal government had the information, they refused to publish a study where they had smokers and smokeless tobacco users side by side to evaluate the mortality risks. That is, who would die and how many of them. They simply would never compare that. Well, Michael Fisher at Altria and his colleagues finally got the government data and analyzed it and published it in Harm Reduction Journal earlier this year. Now, basically, you don't have to look at the individual points here. What you have to know is that at the top of the graph, current smokers, mostly were current smokers, and you can see their, their points are shifted to the right. They had significant risk. Toward the middle are the former smokers. 
and they shift back, but still they're significantly elevated. At the bottom, the bottom cluster of dots are the smokeless tobacco users that were the uh, exclusive users. And their risks don't differentiate from one at all. This was for all causes of death. And then when we look at all cancer deaths, we see the same pattern. The smokers' risks are shifted even further to the right. They come back when they quit smoking, but not all the way. And then the smokeless tobacco risks at the bottom were clustered again around the, the single one point, which means they weren't elevated at all. And finally, they also did diseases of the heart. Same exact pattern. We don't see as much shift to the right among smokers because, of course, heart diseases are caused by lots of things, lots of factors. It's not as easy to, to uh, set uh, smoking at excess mortality when you've got lipids, cholesterol, uh, weight, uh, all kinds of other risk factors. They shift over to, for former. When you when you're, have a heart problem and you quit smoking, your risks fall toward the null, the null very, very quickly. And then finally, for smokeless tobacco users, again, no risk. So this is a quick update of smokeless tobacco and its risks in the United States. For more information, you're welcome to visit one of my websites. Thank you.